introducing with introducing Emily E. Lewis. So thanks, Emily, so much um, for joining us. And just as a bit of the kind of bio and background for Emily, um, she's an attorney with Clyde Snow Attorneys at Law in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, at Clyde Snow, she's the uh, director and shareholder and the co-chair of the Natural Resources and Water Law Practice Group. Emily assists clients in navigating complex water problems. She advises individual water rights owners, water conservancy districts, municipalities, mining companies, and mutual shareholder irrigation companies. Her strategic projects practice extends to innovative water policy work and specialty project management. Currently, she acts as the Utah Water Banking Project Manager, and she also hosts Ripple Effect, which is a podcast putting water into context. And Ripple Effect is how I got connected with Emily. She's actually interviewed me twice for the podcast. Um, and so she knows about a lot of the work that I do. And then at a conference recently, I saw her present on the work that she does. And I realized I didn't know any of that as I was <laughs> talking. Um, and when she gave that presentation at the um, Colorado River Water Users Conference back in December, um, just light bulb went off for me that this really connected to a lot of the work that um, the SWIM Network is focused on. So I'm really pleased um, to introduce Emily and the floor is yours. Awesome. Well, I'm happy here and I actually have two of two podcast uh, interviews because I've also done one with Shelby Smith. And so I'm feeling pretty good with my percentages. <laughs> that or the water world is just really small, which is both. <laughs> um, but as Cora said, uh, my name is Emily Lewis. I am a private law attorney here in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, I, you know, I honestly love my job. I get to do lots of really innovative and creative things. Um, being in private practice, I kind of get to have my fingers in a lot of different projects. Um, one thing that I have been spending a lot of my time on recently is the Utah Water Banking Project. And um, I have a presentation that, you know, I'll give a little short one. Um, it's a topic that I find we get a lot of questions on. And so I might go kind of quickly through my slides because I know that you know, generally after we present, people have like a lot of discussion and like, this is a pretty small group too. So I'm pretty informal. So if you guys have questions while I'm presenting, like, please like pop your hand up or, you know, say hello. Like, I don't need just to pontificate about what we're doing by any means. Um, but I'm pretty excited about this project. Um, we're seeing a lot of really awesome progress here in the state and um, it's getting a lot of really good traction in kind of other water communities. And we've had a lot of discussions recently about with other states about kind of how they can take pieces of this and, and apply it in their home states too. So um, it's pretty exciting. All right, with that, I'll just share my screen. Um, I provided my slides to Bridget a little while, uh, kind of shortly ago too, if you know you guys ever want to see them. Um, um, afterwards. Let's see. I have one too many screens in my office. <laughs> um, so what, what I'm here to kind of talk to you guys a little about a little bit about is um, what we are actually calling our, it's the statewide water marketing development strategy report. And so, um, you know, we kind of call it water banking shorthand because water banking is a pretty large component of what we're doing, but the actual kind of deliverable we're working on here in Utah is spending about a three year effort to come up with a statewide water marketing strategy for the state of Utah to kind of give water users some tools and templates and um, kind of guides for increasing market activity for water um, here in the state of Utah. Um, so, you know, kind of our tagline is exploring the development of market tools favorable to local water users by piloting the Utah Water Banking Act. Um, I really want to be clear that this is a collaborative effort. And so I act as project manager and my law firm is kind of the project manager, but we work very hand in hand with Westwater in their Colorado office, HDR Engineering, um, GovFriend is a public outreach organization here in the state, and then um, our state agency partners, the Utah Division of Water Rights and the Division of Water Resources. So it's very much a collaborative effort, and then we have a very large stakeholder group behind us as well. So I don't think that you guys need to tell you working in water anything different. Um, but, you know, we're experiencing water stress all over. You know, this is nothing new. You guys in California have seen it last year. You had huge cuts to your systems. Um, here in the state of Utah, we are the second driest state in the nation um, uh, behind Nevada. And we are seeing um, a number of very, very challenging water uh, barriers or water issues in the state. Um, we have increased population 
this graph in the corner is our anticipated population growth for the state of Utah. Right now, the state sits at about 3 million people, and it's anticipated by 2065 to have a population of 6 million people, so legitimate doubling of our population. Um, a lot of that is uh, influx from other states, and we've actually seen that a lot just even the last three years of the pandemic. We've had a huge amount of relocation to the state of Utah. Um, climate migration is a real thing. All those Californians leaving and coming, escaping the fires and coming to other places where it's still just as smoky. Um, and then here in the state, we also have, um, you know, a lot of competing, uh, competing needs for our water outside population growth. Um, we, it's a low tax state. We have a lot of industry that wants to come and locate their businesses here. We have, you know, a billion dollar ski industry that is based on snow. We have, you know, recreation in the state of Utah is a huge economic driver. Um, with decreased water supplies, we're seeing big issues with uh, water quality um uh, issues here in our state we have a lot of algal blooms um, we have a lot of problems with temperature in our smaller streams and uh, trout populations and cold water fish populations really suffering um, we also, you know, are a heavy agricult an agricultural state, you know, both uh, economically, but also culturally, you know, we very much, you know, appreciate our farmers and our agricultural sector, and there's a desire to maintain a strong agricultural economy here in the state. Um, and then also, you know, just like everywhere else, you know, new demands are coming up every day. Um, for example, um, we have, uh, due to our land, having a lot of developable land, are having a lot of requests for large data centers to come into the state of Utah. Um, NSA put a large data center out here. Facebook is putting a large data center here. Um, and that's something that, you know, when we wrote our water law back in 1865, you know, that's something we never would have anticipated. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing new demands on our water in addition to kind of like our, uh, our um, uh, existing demands. So um, as you guys are probably seeing, and as you, you, this group in particular is acutely aware, as we have more demands on our water resources, you know, activities to buy, sell, and lease water are increasing across the state as we're moving from sector to sector and water use from sector to sector. And so um, here in the state of Utah, you know, one of the big issues that, that came to the forefront of that activity is that local communities are really concerned about maintaining control of their water. Um, and so there's been a big push in the state of Utah, if this market activity is going to happen, how are we going to give additional tools to uh, local water users to dictate the terms and conditions of market activity? So what we did is, you know, uh, 2017 to 2020. Um, I don't know if gargantuan is a fancy actual term, but it's the term that we like to use here. But um, in 2017 through 2020, we had a very large stakeholder outreach process um, to basically kind of address this question of increased market activity and what can we do in the state of Utah to make sure our water users are feeling like they are have autonomy over their decisions and that, you know, really the control over our water decisions is kept at a local level. And so, um, for kind of starting in 2017, um, we had a lot of discussions that kind of led to this concept of, you know, quote unquote, water banking. And so it kind of came from four distinct areas of thought or kind of areas of activity. Um, one is that in 2017, the state organized its first ag optimization working group, looking at how we can optimize agricultural water, you know, on, on farm improvements, efficiencies, um, you know, most of, uh, like a lot of Western states, 75 to 80% of our water in the state of Utah is in the agricultural sector. So this is a big place for us to focus a lot of our energies. Um, up until probably this week, um, we've had a very limited in-stream flow bill. Um, so in 2017, in 2022, we're going to make some changes to that that we hope get passed very soon. Um, but in, in 2017, our in-stream flow bill was very limited. It did not extend to municipalities. And there was a push to open up our in-stream flow bill to allow municipalities to hold in-stream flows for, agri for uh, water quality purposes. Um, Central Utah Water Conservancy District, which is the wholesaler for water from the federal water projects in the state of Utah, the um, Central Utah Project, who's also one of our clients, um, was exploring some kind of banking-like activities for their own internal operations. And then we also can, in 2017, came up with uh, or released the Governor's Water Strategy Report, which was a large-scale, you know, multiple hundreds of page report 
prepared by 40 water professionals kind of looking at, you know, what is the next 50 years of water in the state of Utah look like? So those four activities kind of led to the concept of each one of them hit on this concept of water banking. And so in 2017, we had coalesced a working group to kind of explore this concept of water banking. What does it mean? You know, how do people use the terms? How could it be used here in the state of Utah? And between 2018 and 2019, um, we had um, probably a, a working group meeting regularly of about 70 different participants. And these came from Farm Bureau, um, you know, municipalities, environmental groups, um, local water users, to really kind of look at what market activity is already existing in the state of Utah. We kind of did some scoping. And then to look at how other states had approached banking or market activity. You know, we looked at Idaho, our sister state to the north, that has a pretty robust state led top down program for um, water banks that got kind of two systems of water banks. We looked to Washington and their water banking statute and kind of said, okay, what are other states doing? What can we take that we think is going to fit here in Utah? Um, and how do we draft a statute to kind of incentivize these activities? So we had um, the water banking stakeholder group meetings. We, um, in 2019, got a Senate joint resolution passed and it passed unanimously that just basically said we endorse the activities of this group to continue discussing the idea of water marketing and water banking. It didn't present any substantive information, but because anything with water is so sensitive and, and it, it affects so many people and it's such a you know um, an important matter here in the state we really wanted to give a lot of cues ahead of time to the legislature that we were going to be doing something so we laid a lot of groundwork really early to say hey this is what we're doing and try to get legislative endorsement before we even brought them any kind of bill so in 2019 we got a joint resolution to you know endorse the study of water banking at that time, we also got a $400,000 appropriation from the state of Utah to kind of give some money behind the study. Um, and then we also, in 2019, applied for um, a $400,000 BOR Water Smart Water Marketing Grant. Um, so basically, we got about $800,000 to kind of put some money behind this, um, this, this study. We also, in 2019 um, and 2020, um, drafted a consensus legislation. So basically, we took all the parts from all the other states that we thought were really helpful and kind of thought, well, how do we make this fit in Utah? And I'll talk about the statute here in a minute and drafted some legislation about what if we were going to incentivize and increase local market activity, what would that look like here? And how would we do that in a way that protects local water users, that you know addresses some of the barriers that they you know, identified in our scoping? Um, and, uh, and so we drafted legislation, and then after the legislation was drafted, we did an additional layer of outreach where we literally did 60 plus speaking events. And so um, we call it the road show because it literally was like the road show. <laughs> like we're, there was like 12 of us out in many cars going to Ephraim and Layton and all over the state of Utah to try and engage local water users um, to kind of explain the statute to them, explain the concepts, because at the end of the day, we really wanted to have a pretty unanimous support of this when it actually got to the legislation or when it actually got to the legislature. So in 2020, we introduced uh, SB 26, which is the water banking amendments. And we um, also received uh, the statewide water marketing development strategy project funding to kind of start. And so in 2020, our bill did pass. It passed unanimously. We didn't have a single um, no vote in the state legislature, which I think um, really speaks to the three, almost four years of effort ahead of time to kind of like cue people up to the discussion and um, uh, get, get their uh, approval. So with that background, you know, like, what did we say was important? You know, like, what, what, how, how, what did we determine was the, what would work here for Utah? And so in drafting that legislation and kind of framing the objectives of the group, we kind of came up with a group working thesis. And, you know, the three buzzwords that we try and always come back to when, you know, either describing the project or framing the project is voluntary, temporary, and local. 
you know, those are similar to the SCPP terms of voluntary, temporary, and compensated, um, you know, if you are familiar with the System Pilot Conservation Program. Um, and then our kind of working theme was to better support Utah's growing water demands, water banking could facilitate local voluntary and temporary transfers of water that generate income for water right owners and incre increase access to water. So that's kind of like what our goal was. So, you know, the bill passed in 2020, and I'll kind of talk about some specifics about what the bill does here in a second. But in a nutshell, really what the bill does is we are promoting the development of market tools that are favorable to local water users. So we're really trying to build leasing programs that are from the ground up that kind of put the local water users in a better position to enter lease transactions, to have their interests protected, um, and to kind of, um, you know, set the terms for like local market activity. And so kind of how we did this is it the bill provides um, or the act provides local water users the ultimate flexibility to design a leasing arrangement that meets local conditions so unlike the idaho bank that kind of has like a set form where you go to the bank and you actually just apply and then they say i have water and then you lease it and that works in idaho very well because they have the snake river our banks are much more focused on kind of like the very kind of micro local level. And so it allows local water users to basically um, set the size and scale of a, of a local water bank service area. So similar to an irrigation company or a municipality, it's intended for our water banks to have a service area in which you could kind of conduct leasing of water within that specific service area. The local participants set the lease prices and terms, you know, length of leases, um, how they're doing their pricing. Um, and we've had some kind of interesting development on how people have done pricing. So I think that's kind of one thing that has been kind of fun to watch happen. And I'll talk about some specifics about that in a second. And then also kind of like how distribution and proceeds from leasing, um, leasing activity was going to occur. You know, who is going to get it, the company, the individual shareholders, the local water users, et cetera. A um, couple other things the, the bill does is it addresses some barriers that were identified by the working group um, that is going to allow for more flexible water use. Um, for example, um, you know, the change application process here in Utah is, is pretty cumbersome. And so, you know, that was one of the big things we heard is that we would do more leasing if this change application process was different. Um, the other thing it does is extend some benefits that water users wanted. Um, and I'll talk about a couple of those in a second. Um, and then we did, even though we did want this to be very kind of ground up, you know, laboratory of democracy, um, local activity, we did still want some touch to the government. So we do have um, the Board of Water Resources, basically water users can apply to have their leasing arrangements approved as a water bank by the Board of Water Resources. And so that kind of allows them to kind of basically like get into the bucket of being a water bank opposed to just a traditional lease between individuals. And then once they're a water bank, they're extended all these benefits. Um, it's just a completeness review. So you just have to basically tell the Board of Water Resources that like we've done all the things that the statute requires and the Board of Water Resources doesn't really do any kind of substantive review of the terms. Like that's left up to the local water users. And then the other thing we did is it's a 10 year window. So, you know, as you probably find this in your, um, your activities, uh, you know, change with water is needed and good, but it's also scary. And so we really try to say this is a pilot project for 10 years. If at the end of the 10 years, the statute falls on its face, no one uses it, it has all these unintended consequences, it's going to automatically um, sunset. So it's a 10 year pilot project at the end of the day. So, you know, why would people use, you know, why would people go through the efforts of organizing a water bank, uh, a leasing arrangement that's a water bank opposed to just leases amongst themselves? Um, you know, first of all, you know, it's without local interest, there is no water bank. So, you know, from the very ground up, it has to be water users who want to do this. Um, you know, as you guys probably have found in your research and work, typically there's people who thought about doing things for years, you know, and they just haven't for whatever reason. And so, you know, it's not like the government's telling people to do things. It's just, if you have local water users who are interested in exploring this, you know, they create the bank. 
So one of the things we did to address some of the concerns they had is we created a streamlined administrative process. So in the state of Utah, if you want to change any use of water, you have to go through an administrative change application process. And what we said is typically you have to do that um, you know, per change, but if you are a water bank and you want to move a water right to be leased into the bank, you do a one-time change application, and that allows you to have a simultaneous approval of both bank uses and your pre-existing uses. So you can kind of, we call that the on-off switch. So you could decide, I want my water in the bank this year, but next year I don't want it, want it in the bank, but I do want it in for year three. So instead of having to like do a change application every time, it's kind of like a one-time change application. You've been reviewed and approved, and then you know you can kind of lease according to bank terms and desires. The other big thing that we did that you know people requested that, that they um, the water users requested is that any water right that's approved to be in a water bank is exempt from forfeiture. And so one of the things we heard from the water users was that um, the uh, municipalities in the state of Utah have forfeiture exemptions if they can demonstrate their water is being held for future use. And the agricultural community wanted to be have uh, an opportunity to have some of their water also be on the same status. And so we see a lot of interest from irrigation companies um, primarily along the Wasatch Front, who are seeing a lot of their service area quickly move to development. And so they don't physically have a means to actually use all their water because it's houses, but they'd still like to maintain control of that water and find another in income stream for that water. And so by having those water rights protected from forfeiture um, is, is, is a, a big incentive for them to participate. Um, another thing that we did is that um, the current soon to be uh, amended in-stream flow bill in the state of Utah is very, very limited. Um, it basically says in-stream flows can only be from um, point A to point B with no intervening diverters. They can only be applied for by certain fishing groups and a couple of state agencies. Um, a water right for an in-stream flow goes through a change application process and it receives the most junior priority in that reach. So, you know, in-stream flows are typically needed when there's no water. And so, you know, under water law, if it has the most junior reach, junior priority date, you're not really getting the benefit of that water. So it was a really, really limited statute. And so what we said is any water right that is approved to be in a water bank can be used for environmental purposes. So basically we kind of had like a little bit of a workaround to our pretty limited in-stream flow bill. And so that really has brought a lot of attention from groups like TNC, TU, the Walton Family Foundation who are really interested in in-stream flows as kind of like their mission. Um, and then, you know, we did have a lot of questions about condemnation. Like if I put my water right in the water bank, you know, am I just basically tagging that water right as excess and can cities come back later and condemn it? Um, we have had like one condemnation suit in the entire history of state of Utah for a water right. So the likelihood of that happening was pretty small, um, but we did, you know, listen to what water users were saying and added a condemnation protection for banked waters. So that's kind of like the benefits that we added to people, you know, kind of like why, you know, if you found a leasing or if you wanted to enter a leasing arrangement, why it might be to your benefit to design it in a way that qualifies for a bank so you can kind of get these particular protections and benefits. So the way that we actually go about like promoting leasing is we have two different kinds of water banks, quote unquote, under the statute. We have a contract water bank, which is essentially just like a contract between a set group of parties who agree to lease water amongst themselves. And so the reason we did this is that there's already a ton of leasing in the state of Utah that's by contract. And so we wanted to have those contracts be extended the ability to be approved as a water bank so they get the various um, uh, uh, benefits that I said on the last slide. Um, and um, so these are kind of voluntary arrangements where all the parties kind of like set the criteria amongst themselves. And then all they really do is basically like submit their contract to the state board of water resources and the board of water resources kind of just stamps it and says, okay, you guys can be a water bank. The only element that we have on there that is a little bit limiting though, is that 
for these contracts, the, the, the party that actually applies for that contract to become a bank and, that, and is a party to the contract has to be a non-federal public entity. And the purpose for this is that we didn't want, you know, private speculators to be able to basically contract amongst themselves and get forfeiture protections. And we also wanted to have, if a contract is, if the applicant is a public entity, then all of like the grandma protections and the public process for having like a public contract approved attached to that contract and that bank. So there can be public participation. So I think realistically, most of our water banks in the state of Utah are going to be contract banks because it's the most simple way to do things. Um, and we have two of those right now um, under our pilot project. And that's our form. Essentially, it's like a you do the contract and you submit a form that kind of summarizes your contract to the state of um, to the state of Boardwater, Board of Water Resources. The other section that we have is the other kind of bank that we have is what we call a statutory water bank. And I'm interested to see if this actually really comes to fruition. One of our pilot projects um, is a statutory water bank and it is taking a lot of time to kind of like figure out what this means in, in practicality. But kind of the goal and the thinking behind this was, you know, in some areas, it might just make sense to have a legal entity that is organized for the sole purpose of administering leasing in that in that area. You know, that could be like a conservation district, you know, where there's a bunch of, you know, shareholders from different companies who want to lease their water in. Or, um, you know, for example, our, our pilot project is trying to get some in-stream flows in a specific reach up in, Park, in Summit County, kind of by Park City. And the goal up there is that, you know, a whole bunch of different people have water, could lease their water into the bank, and the bank actually has like a lease for, to secure the in-stream flow. So they kind of do all the coordinating efforts. And so, you know, they're really kind of framed after and, um, you know, intended to operate as if it were like a, you know, under governance documents. Um, you know, the entity is going to have to have, you know, articles and bylaws like an irrigation company has, or if the entity is like a uh, interlocal agreement between various inter agencies, you know, they'd have to have some kind of like managing agreement. Um, it's not anything too different that happens already. It just is kind of the sole purpose of this entity is to organize leasing. Um, the other thing too is that it's supposed to be open to all interested water users. And so we didn't want there to be a, um, a place where someone just set up like an agricultural bank and said, no, you can't lease this water for in-stream flows if you wanted to, we're only gonna do it for agriculture or no, you can't lease it for domestic uses. Um, that's pretty unlikely to be domestic, um, but it's intended to kind of be more like a, a neutral spot market for water. Um, we'll see, we'll see how this turns out in reality. <laughs> I think the concept and idea is good, but realistically, I think this is going to be like Water Bank 2.0, 3.0 here in the state of Utah. Um, I think we're going to have to get kind of our, our training wheels set with the uh, contract banks first. And then real quickly, this isn't part of the act, but it is a rich element is that water rights have to be, you know, you'll have your contract or your statutory bank set up, you'll apply to the Board of Water Resources, you'll get stamped as a water bank. Once you're a water bank, you know, you're gonna get all the benefits of the statute. But a key element of this is to put any water into that bank, you still have to go through the state's traditional change application process. And so um, 7338 is the statute that governs change applications here in Utah. And this is really important because this is where there is um, an impairment analysis done, making sure moving that water won't hurt downstream water users. You know, there's a public protest period, so people can kind of like come in and, you know, challenge or protest. Um, the distribution elements of how water rights gonna move around the bank service area would happen at the change application, um, change application process. Um, and this is kind of also where we make sure that water rights are good water rights. You know, it's not a bad water right that's been lost to forfeiture. So even though it's not an implicit part of the statute, it's um, an explicit part of the process because we've, we've incorporated it. Okay. So are you guys for timing, if it's 103, like I want to leave some time. Are you a full hour? Are you 130, 1230, 130? Well, I'm in Mountain Standard time. So it's noon there. Are we good on time? 
I yes. think we have actually only budgeted 30 minutes. And so some okay. people might have to be dropping off. Um, That's fine. I unfortunately have to drop off, but if folks are able to stay on and answer questions and Emily, you have some time of yeah. great discussion. Yeah, and I'll just be real quick about one one or two other items here. So basically, like what we're doing is we're piloting this project. We have three pilot projects. And from that is we're going to create a statewide water marketing strategy report that kind of goes over what we found and also kind of creates templates like the application I just showed you. Um, and also, you know, we've got some cool um, like we have like a water widget we're building, which basically brings interested water users through like a series of questions to kind of indicate like, okay, well, you know, you may need to shore up whether or not there's demand in your area to see if you can further a water bank. And then if they decide they have demand, then it kind of like, kind of like a choose your own adventure tree diagram a little bit to kind of like, um, you know, organize the thinking of how to approach one of these. Because I think everyone has lots of excitement, but kind of just coming up with a a, um, a cohesive process for approaching the project has been difficult. And so we're kind of trying to create some templates and guides just to kind of organize in the thinking and asking questions in the right order. So that'll come out in 2024. And then just real quickly, we've got three pilot projects. Um, we've got one up in uh, Snyderville Basin, which is gonna be a statutory bank that is kind of intended for in-stream flows. We have one um, that's a leasing pool between two water users and Hiram Irrigation Company. This is not going to be a bank. They ultimately decided it wasn't worth the effort to be a bank, but they're just going to do an independent lease between two members of an association. Um, and they held a federal contract in a federal reservoir. Um, and But we're still going to track this because this is still relevant data for our purposes. You know, we're agnostic on whether or not they use the statute. Um, but um, that's so this contract is we're just waiting for the BOR's acknowledgement on it and we're, and we're good to go on this. And the other one is a contract bank between an irrigation company, the Nature Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, and our local Division of Wildlife Resources. And this is basically a, a leasing program. Right now it's a following program, um, but eventually we're kind of going to move into um, kind of depletion accounting and crop switching and to see if we can lease some water from switching to lower value or lower. Uh, water intense crops. And the way this one works is kind of cool. I'll just be real quick on it is basically they have, you know, a schedule of dates that the parties have to meet where, you know, they send out an interest statement to shareholders. They see the shareholders say for the year whether or not they're interested in putting their shares in and at what price. Um, after that, the, you know, so the first volley on pricing is at the shareholder level in an irrigation company. We, um, the bank manager that we've set up makes a summary of that. They go to the potential parties who are the lessors um, or the lessees who have money. They come back to the shareholders with a, um, with a uh, potential lease price. And if that's acceptable, the shareholders can opt in to lease their water at that price. So it's kind of, it's kind of like a reverse auction, but not quite. Um, but this is, I think, going to be a pretty common format that people like to will want to use here in the state of Utah, and I anticipate us having a um, uh, some kind of template contract for folks to kind of use and modify that kind of follows a very similar kind of stepped process of, you know, uh, finding an expression of interest, a pricing mechanism, and then a final um, a final lease price and uh, a, con a final contract for that year for leasing. So, um, yeah, and this is our water widget that's kind of like the series of questions. Um, so, yeah, so we're doing like a lot of fun things up here. It's pretty exciting. Um, I will stay for a few minutes and answer questions because I want to make sure that those who have them, um, I love to answer them. Um, it's hard to give you all that information in a 20 minute period, but for those who are here, I'd be happy to ask questions or, you know, bounce any thoughts or ideas you have off. Um, we've definitely been doing a lot of work and we're about halfway through the project. I'm like, quick question for you. So back to the in-stream flow stipulation and how that's kind of changing, do you, mm -hmm. Or does this new framework allow for non-use water right holders to participate in the system like that TNC to you? And yeah, I guess how is that changing? Yeah, so the water banking, the water banking is 
one avenue now to get in-stream flows and pretty much like if you're part of a bank and the bank you know has like uh, in-stream flows as an intended purpose for the bank water you know then and we call it environmental purposes you know we we don't just call it in-stream flows um so that is one way now that potential parties who are interested in that as kind of their mission can participate um parallel to that and i honestly think because of a lot of the activity that's happened from the water banking statute, we are having some pretty large changes to our actual in-stream flow bill. And so the changes that are proposed and will likely be adopted are um, now anybody can apply for an in-stream flow, not just fishing groups and state agencies. They removed the priority um, uh, pr uh, penalty that was part of it. And they removed the requirement that there be an intervening, uh, no intervening diverter. So it's really going to open it up a lot. Um, if that kind of takes some of the wind out of the sails for banking, we're not quite sure yet. You know, like it potentially could, um, but that's okay. Like you know, I think we're here is we're just here to provide tools. And if the bank is not the right tool, you know, we'd still like people to use this, just the regular in-stream flow statute. Right. And with that in-stream flow bill, do you see Utah as kind of a first mover there? Or have you seen kind of changes to other in-stream flow bills that look similar to this across, you know, the Western U.S.? Um, Utah's kind of a slow train on this part. <laughs> I think we probably have one of the most restrictive in-stream flow bills in the Western United States. I mean, you look at Oregon, Oregon had, you know, their in-stream flow bill in the 1990s, and they were so progressive as to, you know, I think it's a 25% of any water rate that goes through that change is just reserved for the stream. So um, for us, um, I think it's, 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 what's interesting about this change to our the new in-stream flow bill is it was drafted with the state engineer and farm bureau representatives and so it's gotten a lot more support and is a little less scary than prior activities because i do think that farmers are starting to see and you know they're always going to be the most savvy about their water anyway um but are, are recognizing that realistically market activity for their water is going to have to be part of their business portfolio you know like either they're going to get on board or someone's going to take it or they're going to buy and dry, you know. Um, so I think with that, you know, boogeyman in the background, this is getting a lot more support than prior activities. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? I saw a hand. Cool. That's a great presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry it was too long. <laughs> it's hard no, to. No, no. That's good. Half an hour is too short for this. Yeah. Well, and we're going to be doing a ton of stuff. I mean, like we, I mean, we're literally in the middle of our year program or, or for, we originally were going to be a three-year project. And then with COVID we had, it, we, we started tw July, 2020 was our start date. And so like we remotely trying to organize with rural water users out in the middle of Utah, like very difficult. Um, and so we actually did get an extension are going to be running it through 2024, but like our ultimate goal is to have like pretty usable tools, like, you know, like a website to have templates to have, you know, guides and stuff like that, because I think that one thing we're learning is just that nobody has any bandwidth <laughs> for anything. <laughs> And so for us to really get this activity off the ground, whatever we can do to reduce transaction costs and kind of get people like to the immediate questions that need to be answered and kind of take away the noise, you know, about what is this, you know, the more traction we're going to get on it having it happen. Cool. Anyway, I'll put my email out here, you guys, too, for the chat. Um, you're welcome to write me questions or whatever. Um, I also put my podcast up there. Um, Shelby did a great one. Actually, my dad said, my dad was like, I really like the regenerative ag lady. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> I had so much fun on it. Yeah. And I've interviewed Cora twice. So if you guys have topics or, I mean, I'm always looking for content, weekly podcasts with a lot to produce. So <laughs> you guys have thoughts or ideas. So. Cool. Thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate it. And I know everybody, everybody that came does as well. So um, hopefully we'll, we'll talk soon and uh, thanks for joining us. Yep, for sure. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks, Emily.